this is to my eye the most interesting in-depth take on the Obama administration so far partly because it reports that the president plowed ahead on health reform over the objections of his closest advisors including Rahm Emanuel, David Axelrod and Vice President Biden Hi, Jonathan. Welcome back to WNYC. Hi, Brian. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. As I mentioned, my, my wife and I listen to you almost every day. <laughs> Great to hear it. And this, this uh, I, we've got to do this health care story first. Biden, Axelrod, Rahm Emanuel, all against pushing for health reform? That's right. Uh, this was one of the most startling things that I, I learned when I was working on the book. Uh, I learned it fairly early on because during the transition, uh, Joe Biden said to uh, the president-elect, look, the people will give you a pass, the voters will give you a pass, given the grave economic crisis. Uh, Christina Romer, the chairwoman of the Council of Economic Advisors, told him, um, it, Roosevelt waited two years, she was a Franklin Roosevelt expert, two years after he came in before he introduced Social Security because he was fighting the Depression first, you're in the same position, you should hold off. Rahm Emanuel said to me, quote, I begged the president not to do this, unquote. And David Axelrod, uh, even though he was passionate on the health care issue because of some things in his own family, thought that it was better to lead with energy. Uh, so then the question becomes, uh, it's a natural one, so why'd you do it? Why did he do it? And, and when I interviewed the president, I did ask him uh, why he went ahead, because as you may recall, Brian, during the campaign, he only promised to do health care by the end of his uh, first four-year term. Um, and he did not stress it heavily in the campaign, not nearly as heavily as uh, Edwards or Hillary Clinton. And his answer to me was uh, that, uh, you know, the president said, I told Nancy Pelosi that I'd go down 10 to 15 points in the polls if we did this and that I might have trouble getting reelected. So I kind of repeated the question. I said, so why'd you do it? And he said, because if I didn't do it now, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and so I, I really was very, very struck through the whole process. He was the one uh, who was uh, most committed to moving forward. Does it show Obama to be somewhat of a conventional liberal? I mean, David Brooks, among others, have framed it that way, that you know, rather than being the post-partisan new thinker, he went first and most passionately for an old-fashioned mandate and subsidized government program for health? Well, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think that uh, he is a progressive, um, but that he's a pragmatic uh, progressive. And one of the main reasons why he wanted to do this uh, was not just uh, to help those facing medical bankruptcy, um, folks in trouble, although on election night when he kind of told himself that he was going to do this, uh, those were some of the folks he was hearing from first. But a lot of it was for fiscal reasons. He simply believed, as he told me, that the status quo was unsustainable for the country and that if we can continued on this path, that 70 percent, and here he paused and said 7-0, 70 percent of non-defense dis uh, discretionary spending would, would be consumed by uh, entitlement. So, uh, he thought that there were both fiscal and moral reasons, um, and he didn't see it as a big lefty program. Remember, this program, this is what's so nutty about some of the opposition, this was the Howard Baker, Bob Dole plan from the 1990s, and, and then they and again endorsed it in 2009. So the idea that this was some sort of socialist plan was just wrong. The idea of mandates, by the way, uh, which he had avoided talking about in the campaign because he thought they were a loser. But Hillary quite rightly said, you, you can't end uh, discrimination uh, against people with pre-existing conditions without mandates. But that was a, a conservative idea originally. And Mitt Romney was a big proponent of mandates because no reform works without those mandates. That was a, a really interesting turn for the president, I think, because that was one of the high-profile disagreements between him and Hillary Clinton during the campaign. Right. She wanted the mandates. He didn't want to infringe on individuals, individual choice that much. But ultimately, it became the centerpiece of the economics of his health reform plan. Yeah, and he was, uh, honestly, he was kind of a pandering a little bit uh, to younger voters at that point of the campaign because 
by saying, uh, you know, I don't want to force anybody to buy insurance. Uh, that that was his base at that point. Uh, and that's who really doesn't like and, being forced. But, but he knew he knew healthy exactly, and he knew perfectly well that any plan uh, must have mandates, or it simply doesn't work. So what happened to no drama, Obama? You know, the guy who avoids internal conflict after these first two stories that you've told. Well, he, first of all, the, the health care uh, story, there wasn't, um, well, there was some internal conflict uh, over whether it should go in the budget. Um, but then once the president decided, Rahm Emanuel did everything he could to make it happen. So there, they weren't undermining the president. They weren't, you know, in dissension. They were trying to figure out how to get the votes to, to get it done and how to deal with... Uh, the liberals on the public option. I go through in, in some detail how all of that unfolded uh, from the inside. But uh, they, it is not a, a strife-torn administration the way some others have been. And there's a reason for that, which is that Obama just simply wouldn't tolerate it. And he's very intolerant uh, of leaks. But when you're, when you're up uh, where the oxygen is thin, you know, when you're at the pinnacle of power, there are always going to be sharp elbows. And I do try to... Uh, to explain uh, how some of that played out. You explore both what you call his Zen temperament and his crisp approach to decision making, which you call very different from President Bill Clinton. Uh, how do a Zen temperament and a crisp approach to decision making fit together? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, and I have a whole chapter called the Unbubba where I. I Compare and contrast his his uh, leadership style to Bill Clinton's, and and each of them get high marks in different areas. Um, uh, Obama is like a professional athlete, a certain kind of professional athlete who manages to be very intense and relaxed at the same time. I mean, think of you know one of his sports heroes, Michael Jordan, or uh, uh, any of you know, them, Kobe, any of them at the and top, focused. right? Relaxed and focused, and that's. That's Obama, uh, and uh, his friend Arnie Duncan, the education secretary who plays basketball with him, I, I, I talk to his, his basketball buddies a lot about the way he, some of the way he is on the court also, you can see uh, in meetings. But he's uh, what was described to me as a deductive thinker, whereas Bill Clinton is an inductive thinker. Uh, so Obama likes to move in a very organized fashion uh, uh, from an idea, then he explores the idea, he tests it, he calls on different people in the room to get their reaction to the idea. And if, if you're not ready, if you don't come to play, you're not likely to be at the next meeting. He doesn't, he doesn't have a lot of time for wallflowers, right? So uh, he, he, there is a thorough debate or discussion of the meeting. He sometimes polls the people afterward and he doesn't necessarily go with what they, mm -hmm. what the consensus is. Sometimes they're trying to kiss up to him. He's not really into that. He's very uh, uncomfortable with that, and that's not a smart play if you're in the room with him. Then when he makes a decision, he's very crisp, and he's, he's very clear about, here's my decision, and we're going to do A, B, C, and D. So he has a, a clear-headedness uh, about him, and of course he never loses his temper.